Well, hey, uh, if it's okay, um, because, you know, you guys don't know me yet, I, I wanted to give just a little bit of my story that I think will hopefully kind of help uh, make some of what I'm going to talk about today make sense, okay? Um, so if that's okay, um, I'm, uh, I'm 38 now, I'm getting old, 38 now, um, but when I was 18, I was an atheist. I didn't grow up in church, I grew up in the Louisville area, it's a little bit north of here. I was an atheist who had a power encounter with the Holy Spirit and decided I was no longer an atheist. Uh, you know, when the Holy Spirit shows up and becomes very real, uh, you give up on whatever dead religion you thought you had or didn't have, okay? So I came to know Jesus kind of in a powerful way, and immediately the Holy Spirit started to speak to me about doing missions in Africa. And uh, I was just saved, and I was actually in a church context that didn't believe the Holy Spirit spoke. So that was a little tricky, because uh, I kind of thought I was going crazy, because the Holy Spirit was definitely speaking Africa, Africa, missions, Muslims, you know, evangelism. And... Uh, so anyway, about three years went by, and I was praying, just growing in the Lord, and every day praying about this call to Africa. And uh, one of the things that's a little crazy about the way that the Lord led me is every day when I prayed, I heard the Holy Spirit say the same stuff over and over, the most dangerous things you've ever heard. Holy Spirit, who am I going with? You're going by yourself. Lord, you know, that sounds like a really bad idea to me. What am I going to take with me? Don't take anything with you. Take nothing? Like no money? Like what they did in the Bible that one time? Seems like a bad plan. All right, well, who am I going to go minister to? I'll show you what you're going to do when you get there. Lord, like, you know, they've got missions organizations that know what they're doing. This seems pretty reckless. Well, three years went by. I prayed it every day. And by the end of three years, just as a little leadership lesson for you guys, if you submit the same plans to the Lord over and over, and you don't have any skin in the game, you're really willing to let him lead, he'll lead you. And if you just say yes, 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 eventually he's going to give you the timing of when it's time to take those steps. And if I can be honest, when the Holy Spirit started speaking to me about missions in Africa, I thought it was probably going to be some months, maybe a year. It was over three years. And just sometimes the Lord's timing is not our timing, and that's okay. If we follow his will, his plan, it's always better. Well, three years comes and goes. Holy Spirit now says, it's time. Start getting ready. So I book a flight to the most Muslim African country I can get into, the nation of Mali, 99.9% Muslim. That's pretty Muslim. And uh, I, I land, and I literally don't know a soul on the continent. I've got about $1.50 in my pocket, but it's in four different currencies at this point because uh, the landing in different, you know, that's Starbucks in Heathrow Airport. It got me. I don't know what to tell you. I, and so I land with nothing. I don't know anybody. And that night, and I don't have time to give you the, the full story, but I want to give you just a little snapshot because it's so bizarre. That night, as I landed... And I'm there, and I believe I'm doing the will of the Lord. I wind up actually getting abducted by a crime syndicate. Yeah, but I'm here, so I'm not dead. So there's good news, right? right? It, it landed okay. And, and long story short, this, uh, this crime lord has got henchmen posted at all the major ports, airport, bus, train station, ferries, in order to look for white tourists from America to abduct, to then figure out what one of bi- five bad things they're going to do to you know, sell them, you know, uh, you know, hold them for ransom, take all their money and kill them. I mean, some really bad stuff. Well, the wildest thing happens because I was on a Holy Spirit assignment. And you know, when you do the will of the Lord, there's, the rules are a little different. <laughs> That's about all I could say. I, I, uh, I get taken out to the desert. You guys ever seen National Geographic, those mud hut villages? I've been there. It's out in the middle of the Sahara Desert. I was there, Okay. And uh, I wake up the next morning, and I'm now being interviewed by this crime lord, okay? And I don't know what's happening. I just know something is really off. I'm out in the desert. Uh, This is not a good place to be for a uh, white dude from Texas. And uh, I don't realize I'm being interviewed by this crime lord who knows perfect English, and he's the only person I've really been able to speak to so far that I can actually have a conversation with. I landed in a French-speaking nation. I know English not so well. I think I cheated through high school to get, uh, you know, a passing grade. And I've got pig Latin down, neither of which help you if you're in a French-speaking country. And so I don't have the ability to communicate with anybody. This guy's asking me questions, and he's saying, you know, why are you here? I said, I'm here to get you saved. He goes, I don't know who I'm talking to, you know. And he goes, uh, goes, no, 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 I'm a big man in Mali. You're not here to get me saved. I said, well, you asked. He said, well, who do you know? I said, well, uh, I mean, I know you now. He said, well, what are you here to do? I said, I'm here to preach the gospel. He said, well, who are you going to stay with? And I said, well, you? I mean, he said, you came to Africa with no plan and no money and nothing. He said, this is not possible. I said, that's me, baby. I go, yeah, yeah, that's, you got it. The wildest thing happened, and this was the purpose of the Lord all along. 
If you think about the story of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, you guys kind of picture that one? It doesn't make any sense that those guys were buddies. Nebuchadnezzar is a demon-worshiping king. And Daniel's this, like, godly, you know, chasing after God, you know, life of prayer kind of guy. But God allowed uh, Daniel to curry favor with a ruler in order to accomplish the purposes of the Lord in his generation. I'm in this conversation with this crime lord, and in 30 minutes, he falls in like with me. By the end of the conversation, this is what he says. I make you big man in Mali. I help you preach in all the places. I help you. You come live with me. (laughs) Now, remember, I'm out in the desert in a mud hut village 100 miles from anything. There ain't no 7-Elevens over there. And I said, "Uh, Holy Spirit, what am I supposed to do with this really odd offer? And I heard the Holy Spirit tell me two things I will never forget. First, this guy is bad news. Second, Go live with him. (laughs) Thanks, Jesus. Appreciate you. I wind up living with this guy, and here's the the twist of the story. I told you I'm in a French-speaking nation. Well, this crime syndicate, their business is to get white English-speaking tourists into the car so that they can take them and do whatever. So all of this guy's henchmen all have one thing in common. They know a little bit of English. It's probably the only place in the entire, entire country I can actually minister. It's the only place. And one by one, they started giving their lives to Jesus. And I started discipling them inside this crime lord's house. Had I not lived it, I wouldn't believe it. So if you guys call me a liar, I'm in agreement with you. I wouldn't blame you. I'm just, I'm just the guy who came up here and took the mic. I don't know. The Lord started to do the wildest stuff over the course of time. It just, these guys are giving their lives to the Lord and then they're starting to make disciples. It was unbelievable. It's the kind of stuff you can't make happen. It wasn't because I'm smart, because Lord knows my SAT scores would tell you a different story. It's not because of anything except the purposes of the Lord and the willingness and obedience of a heart. And I just want to speak to you. There's things that the Lord wants to do in your lives and the lives around you here in Arlington that you're going to have to take those steps. You're going to have to say yes. And some of them are going to look a little crazy, a little unconventional, a little this, a little that, a little boring, a little lame. He's got purposes. So I'm there for a season of time, and the Holy Spirit then makes it clear I'm supposed to come home. And I'm really mad about that because I'm out there doing the stuff. I mean, this is like Acts 29 for real, okay? I'm out, there's only 28 chapters in Acts 29, or Acts 20, and Acts. So... I'm out there doing the stuff, and I'm, I'm seeing the Lord move, and I, I'm saying, Holy Spirit, you know, what's next? And I hear, the, I hear the Lord tell me, it's time to go back to Arlington. I have another assignment for you. I was like, what could possibly be more important than this? Like, I'm out here doing this stuff, frontline missions, and you've got an assignment for me in Arlington? What the heck is that? And the Lord made it so clear. He just made it so clear. And I said, yes, Lord, and I came back. And then he turned the volume all the way down, and didn't talk about anything related to ministry for a year and a half. I'll just give you another little leadership lesson. Sometimes your obedience will be costly. Sometimes your obedience, we just think that the Lord is like us. (laughs) He's not. His ways are not our ways. We can't lean on our own understanding. He's just, he's got a plan. Here's what our job is. We obey. We follow the Lord. We love him with all our heart, and we trust that he's got a plan that's bigger and better and smarter than us. After a year and a half, I promise this is all going somewhere. After a year and a half, uh, I'm sitting on my couch one day, and I'm just reading a book on uh, my day off. And I have the most uh, powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit I've ever had, I mean, to to this day. I've known the Lord for about 20 years now. And to this day, the most powerful encounter I've ever had, I'm sitting on my couch just reading a book on my day off. And the Holy Spirit, I feel the presence of the Lord fall in the room real thick. And then I hear the following phrases that totally messed up my life. I heard the Holy Spirit say, start a daily prayer meeting tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. and don't stop until I come back. It's a daily prayer? That sounds like prison to me. 5 a.m.? Come on, you're not even awake at 5 a.m. Tomorrow? Like tomorrow? Like 10 hours from now tomorrow? Till you come back? I don't even want to talk about that. But the Lord made it so clear, and I I couldn't get up off the floor. I was just under the presence of the Lord for about 30 minutes. Just found myself saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And so that next day, we started a prayer meeting. I'm a missions guy. I don't want to be a prayer guy. I want to be a missions guy. I'm trying to figure out how to go get martyred in the mission field, not how to be chained to Arlington for the rest of my life, okay? The Lord's like, well, tough noogies, bro. You just do what I tell you. 
We started a prayer meeting the next morning. I just made some phone calls, sent out some emails. We started a prayer meeting the next morning. That was September 13th, 2005. We've never missed a day, not one day ever since that day. We've had 5 a.m. prayer meetings every single day, seven days a week. And that's what's turned into what we call the prayer room missions base. It's over in Pantigo. So right now, after you know, however many years that is, 13, 14 years, what's kind of cool is it's actually a tool for you if you want it. 18 hours a day now, from 5 a.m. till 11 p.m., seven days a week, there's live worship music. There's a worship team or a worship leader on keys or on guitar. 18 hours a day, seven days a week, your birthday, my birthday, Christmas, doesn't matter. There is a prayer meeting going on 18 hours a day, and here's the purpose of that prayer meeting. We want to exalt Jesus and tell him that he's worthy. And we want to give a room for you to come cry in. Pray through your prayer list, read the Bible, pace back and forth and tell Jesus you love him. Engage with the worship songs, engage with the prayer meeting, or don't, just sit back on some of the pillows and take a nap, I don't care. We've set that room up to exalt Jesus and to give you a tool, because it's open to the church of the region. And so people come from maybe like 100 different churches that stick their head in for five minutes, five hours, whatever you want to do. It's there. You don't ever have to ask permission, just go. So it's right down the road, probably, I don't know, three, four miles from here or something like that. It's open 18 hours a day as a resource to you of a place to encounter the Lord. Well, it's that context that the Lord called me off the mission field. I thought, man, I'm doing this assignment. I know this is what God wants for me for my life. What else, you know, might he have for me? He called me off the mission field to plant a prayer room here in the Arlington area for his exaltation and for you to be able to come into whenever you want to and be able to connect with him. So that's my story. That's my context, okay? Now, I want to tell you this, and I'm, I'm just saying, I, I don't do this to make a lot of money. I do this because I want to be helpful. I've been sitting in a prayer room for 13 years every day, okay? I've learned a couple of things about prayer, and I've done the best that I can to create some resources to help you learn about prayer, okay? And I brought some of them today. So I've got one here I'll just talk about. They're in the red room, is that right? They're in the red room. Um, but this is one of the resources. It's an eight-part series. It's called Having an Actual Prayer Life. And it just, it's the practical stuff. I'm, I mean, you can tell me I'm like a doofus. Like, I'm not like super smart, theological. I just, I love the Bible. I love Jesus. I'm so simple. I like to present practical content. How do I help you? How do I help me know Jesus, walk with him? And so most of those series back there, it's all really practical stuff. So this one is like eight sessions on what is actually talking to Jesus a lot look like? How does that look? Okay. So I just wanted to make you aware that that's back there. And now, finally, with all that out of the way, we can get into the Word. Amen? Amen. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus that you would come and visit us this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray and I'm believing, I'm trusting that you want to make impact in the lives of these people. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for these saints that love you. I pray, open their hearts and drop into them the Word of Truth this morning from your Word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, I'm entitled uh, this message, An Invitation to Friendship. And I want to tell you that when I think about prayer, I'm mostly thinking about friendship with Jesus. I'm not mostly thinking about a list of things that I have to pray for or stuff I got to do. When I'm thinking about the subject of prayer, I'm mostly thinking about me being friends with God. Now, here's how this works on earth. When you and I have a conversation, you you know, we're sitting across a coffee table and and we're sharing life and we're, we're having a conversation. We call that talking. When you do it with God, it's called prayer. That's what prayer is. It's talking to God. It's God talking back. It's you talking to God. It's God talking back. That's what prayer is. It's just conversation with God. And so we've made prayer like something other than. We've made prayer unreachable. We've made prayer this like discipline of the faith. It's not a discipline of the faith for me to talk to my wife. In fact, if I ever told her it was a discipline of the faith, I might be looking for one of your couches to sleep on that night. It is not a discipline of the faith to talk with Jesus. We started a relationship with him. And what I want to hope, hopefully do this morning is give a couple of nuggets that will maybe stir your heart to want to go deeper and deeper in that friendship. So I just want to even invite you now, posture your heart and say, oh God, help me walk out of this room today with a greater desire for friendship with you. Amen? All right. Well, I want to talk about friendship with God like a garden, okay? Cultivating a garden. So the concept of a garden, you know, cultivating, if any of you guys have seen that garden down the street, you know your neighbors three over that don't ever mow their lawn, and if you ever peek over the fence and you see their garden, it's 
atrocious, okay? Overgrown, rocks everywhere, critters running through it, soggy, yucky fruit, worms coming out of it. That's not the garden that you and I want. The garden you and I want is the one that's been cultivated. Same concept, could be the same size, but the, the soil's been tilled. The weeds have been pulled out. The rocks have been thrown over the fence into the other guy's yard. The, we want a garden that's been cultivated, and that's where we get the best fruit. I mean, those veggies, you pull them right off, and just, just eat it right there in the backyard. We want a cultivated garden. That's what our relationship with Jesus can look like, one or the other. And I just want to tell you, if we're not careful, this isn't a judgment. This is just life. If we're not careful, by default, our garden looks like the other guy's garden. That's what the default garden looks like. If you don't tend to it, if you don't pay attention to it, it winds up overgrown and yucky. But we can have this cultivated garden in a relationship with Jesus, but it's going to take a little bit of effort. It's going to take a little bit of work. We can't wind up with that beautiful cultivated garden just by accident. It's going to take some investment. Now, I want to share a verse with you this morning. I know you know. I think we know this verse so well, it's lost all meaning. And I want to hopefully give us a, just a one little uh, you know, uh, shift of, a, of an insight on John 3.16 to hopefully awaken our hearts a little bit. You guys know John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I want to give you a slightly different take on John 3.16. When we talk about God loving, it sounds like he's obligated. Like, it's like, well, you know, he's God. He's got to love the world. It's, I mean, he's God. He made it, so he better love it. So he has to love us. I want to just, like, give us a little bit of insight. Let's shift the word love to like. Just for a second. I think it changes the meaning entirely for us that are so used to the verse, okay? Let me, let me just say it this way. For God so liked people. For God so liked people. He liked people so much. He said, son, you're up. He said, I got to go get them. I like them a lot. And there's only one way I get them. So I'm going to need to give you up. I'm going to actually need you to die in their stead because I so like, I enjoy, I want people. He's not obligated. He's desiring. His heart is overflowing with desire. God so likes people that he gave us Jesus so that we could be in relationship with him. Not so that he could get us saved. Not so we could just exist as a saved person. He wants relationship. He loves it. He so likes people. You know, with this revelation, in my opinion, it changes the conversation entirely. If I'm talking to a God that likes me, a God that went so far because he likes me, not because of obligatory love, because of a choice. He looked at me, and I don't know how he thought he was good in a good deal when he looked at me. He looked at me and went, I want that guy. I, can't, I need him. What do I got to do to get him? I know what I got to do. I'm going to do it too. I will go the distance. I want that guy. I like him. For God so liked you that he gave his son. You know, when it comes to this relationship between us and God, I want to do the best I can to forget what I think I know. To forget what maybe what culture's told me. You know, maybe what my own heart accuses me, what the enemy accuses me. I want to talk about the relationship between me and God the way Jesus talks about the relationship between me and God. Now, can I give you a verse here? Let's put that verse up out of uh, Matthew 5, uh, 9, 15. Now, in this verse, Matthew 9, 15, look at that. This is great. Look at these slides, man. This is awesome. <laughs> this is epic. Look at a revival over there spelt on three lines. This is, man, this is glory right here. I'm in my element. Okay. All right. So Matthew uh, 9, 15, this is Jesus, and he's talking about a lot of different things, but I want to focus on the aspect of the relationship that when he's going to give a parable about how he feels about people, this is the way he described us, okay? And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away, and then they'll fast. I don't want to talk about fasting this morning. Stephen over there going, praise God. Uh, the, uh, I don't want to talk about even the, the, the paradigm of Jesus being the bridegroom. I want to talk about Jesus calling us the friends of the bridegroom. And here's what I want to talk about for a second. As a pastor, I have this unbelievable privilege. Every now and then I get to do a wedding, okay? And here's how it always goes, all right? The, uh, the wedding party, all the bridesmaids, the, the bride and all the bridesmaids, they're back in that part of the church. And they got a little room back there. And they're back there doing makeup and God knows what they're doing back there. I don't know. I don't go back there. 
Okay? I don't know what's happening on the girl's side. I know what's happening on the boy's side, though. Let me tell you what's happening. They're snapping towels at each other. They're giving each other a hard time. They're telling embarrassing stories from when, when the groom was five years old. Do you remember what you did? You know that little girl in elementary school, man? You tried to kiss her. I mean, just, they're telling stories. They're giving each other a hard time. They're eating. They're like tightening each other's ties and pretending it's a noose. I mean, it's always so fun to be back with the groomsmen. They're, it's just fun. And I get to be like a fly on the wall and kind of watch all this. Can I tell you? These guys fly from all across the country to be there with their bro on his big day. They're there. It's, it is intimate. It is fun. It's fellowship. It's sweet. It's funny. It is like the nearest bros that they could possibly be. And the groom has decided on my wedding day, I want to surround myself with my boys. I want them close to me. Now, Jesus could use any picture he wanted when talking about Christians, disciples. He calls us the friends of the bridegroom. The ones that are there in that back room in close proximity, sharing stories. This is the way Jesus, this isn't like some other person. This is the way Jesus described what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus, to be friends of the bridegroom. That's, that shifts my heart. When I start to think about that and go, you like people so much, you didn't just save us. You wanted us to be like best friends, the best men at the wedding friendship. Do you know how different that is than the attendees? I mean, the attendees at a wedding and the groomsmen at a wedding, their days look very different that day. The ones that are observers, the ones that come to the wedding, they all came because they like the bride or they like the groom. But the experience of those that are in that back room with the groom. In the group with the groomsmen, and they're they're sharing, they're all wearing the same clothes, and just there is something sweet about that fellowship. And Jesus said it wasn't about those who attend the wedding. He said, Our invitation is to be those that are the friends of the bridegroom kind of intimate friendship with Jesus. You get that? That's what prayer is about. That's what prayer is about. Being a friend near and dear, tight with Jesus. And we've got to follow him. We've got to obey. We can't, Jesus is not our homeboy in the sense that we can treat him lightly. But he wants us to be deep friends with him. And that's the invitation he gave. You guys know the book of John was written by John, right? The apostle John. Can I tell you how John talked about himself? I think John got it. I love this. I love reading this. This is John 21 verse 20. Again, John writing about himself. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was with them. This is the one who had leaned his head back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who's going to betray you? John, the apostle John understood something you and I need to get on board with. John, when he talked about himself, went, oh, you know, Jesus is favorite. Like the one that Jesus really, really likes. The one he is wild in friendship about. He just, he thinks I'm the greatest. Do you know what's great about God? There is no end to his relational or emotional capacity. So you could be his favorite and it not take anything away from me being able to be his favorite. Now, all the rest of us, we got relational limitations, but that is not the case with God. So we can all be his favorite and John, John ran with it. John took a hold of it. He said, the one Jesus really likes, the disciple that Jesus is just like wild about, his favorite. Guys, I think we can have this. I think most of what's happening in our lives with the Lord are some blockades that maybe people have put up, we put up, but not Jesus. God so liked people, he sent Jesus to go get friends of the bridegroom on the wedding day. God so likes you, he wants you in way deeper friendship with him than we are now. I know that because I want to be in deeper friendship. I've been trying to cultivate that garden, grow in friendship. I'm not, I'm not done. I want so much more because I feel the invitation. That's why I'm entitled this message this morning, an invitation to friendship. Because I think we can do with this message what we want. We can hear it and go, cool, neat verse. That's great. Or we can take a hold of it. We can go, I am never going to go another day without making my life about that. I want to have friendship. The friendship he wants to have with me. 
It's not even asking for something that like we made up or church leaders made up. This was Jesus's idea. Think about what salvation is now. Think about what this means. That it's not about rules and, and coming to know a taskmaster. It's about coming to know the kindest wisest, most gentle, knowledgeable, understanding, emotionally available person that has ever been. And he says, you know, would you be my best friend? Would you, I mean, it's going to take some work, but would you like draw really, really near to me? Would you fly across the country kind of near with me? Would you be in that back room with the other guys near with me? This is the way that God looks at the relationship between us and him. This is one aspect. You guys know the others. I just want to focus on the friendship thing this morning because I think this is something we're missing. I think this is something we've heard. Oh, that's for that other guy. Well, that's for the prayer guru. This is for you. Jesus likes you, and he wants you to be a near and dear friend with him. But it takes, it takes a little bit of energy. It doesn't just happen on accident. You know, I want to give you a verse out of Psalms 27. This is King David. We love David, right? When I think about David, I think about the busiest man in Israel. Right, he's the king. He got all this king stuff to do. Meetings and decisions and angry people and naysayers and this and that. Like, and when you're the king of Israel, you a busy bro, okay? And I think about David as the busiest man trying to be a dad and, you know, be a husband and, and trying to work his way out of some stupid decisions he's made and, and trying to lead the nation. This is a very busy man. Can I tell you what King David said, Psalm 27, 4? He said, one thing I've asked of the Lord, that I shall seek. I'm asking it of God and I will seek it. I will do it. I will be about it. I will set my heart. I will set the pace of my life. I will be about this thing. I'm not just asking him for it. I'm going to put legs to it. That which I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Inquire, meditate. There's a number of different uh, uh, translations. I like the word inquire. I think it really catches what's being said there because let me tell you what's going on here. David, if you didn't know this, David was nuts. David had a house of prayer like we've got over in Pantigo. He had it in his backyard. He set up this tent. It was called David's Tabernacle. And he set the Ark of the Covenant in there, and he had singers and musicians around it. And all day, all night, all day, they were never stopping singing praises uh, to God. During David's reign, there was no temple. There was just this tent. The temple was built by his son Solomon. But here's David saying, I want to go into that temple, that sanctuary, that tent, that house of prayer, all the days of my life. And I'm going to do two things when I'm in there. I want to encounter God. I want to gaze on his beauty. I want to, I want to see him for how majestic he is. And I want that to touch my emotions. I want to be impacted by the goodness of God, by who he is. And second, I want to inquire. I want to ask him about life. I want to find out about what do I do? How do I be king? I want to go in there and I want to encounter God. And while I'm in there, I want to go, what am I supposed to do about this big decision that I got coming up? How am I supposed to lead my family? What am I supposed to do about this job situation, this new opportunity, this promotion, this thing I'm thinking about taking on? What am I supposed to do? To gaze on the beauty of the Lord, to encounter him, and to inquire, to ask him questions about life. David said, I'm the busiest man in Israel. Here's my commentary. I'm the busiest man in Israel. Here's the one thing I got to have, though. I got to be in a place where I can connect with God every single day that I can encounter him. I can't just have the motions. I've got to encounter him. I've got to have him touch my spirit, engage my heart, awaken my identity. I've got to encounter him. And second, I've got to ask him questions because I don't know what I'm doing. I've got to figure out this whole life thing and he's the only one that really understands. I'm going to go in there every day now, I pose this to you because I know the difficulty of being in the rat race. All the stuff going on, work, kids, school, all the stuff going on. I know how difficult it is to have an actual prayer life. I want to tell you, there is a room four miles down the road that's open 18 hours a day, seven days a week to help you, to be a resource, to be a tool. You don't owe it anything. Just go in, be there for however many minutes you want, and then leave. But it's a room that's set up like this. 
It's a room that's been set up for you to do that. Maybe you've got a, a space in your house. Maybe, you know, there's access to the church. or what. I, just Here's the thing I'm, I'm really after every day. And it's not about just going through the routines. You've got to reach for him and encounter the Lord. And if you will do this every day, encounter and ask him questions, this is the foundation of our conversation with the Lord. I want to understand the relationship just a little bit. When we think about God, if we have a wrong perspective about him, we won't talk to him much. If we think he's an angry tax master, we won't go to him. I just want to give you a few verses. 1 John 4, 16, Romans 8, 15, John 3, 29. We know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. That's who he is. Angry taskmaster is not on the list. He is love. He is approachable. Furthermore, the spirit you received after, uh, what's, whoa, having a hard time here, folks. Maybe you can read it for me. The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. He is a father who loves you, who is tender, who will receive you, who wants to hear from you. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine. This is John the Baptist talking about Jesus again, calling him this bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom. This is the way that God wants us to think about him. He wants us to relate to him as a God of love, a loving father, that, that groom that's inviting us to be one of the best men in the wedding. This is how he wants us to approach him. And when we don't think of him that way, when we use the wrong paradigms that we saw on TV or heard or grew up with or whatever, and we got a wrong paradigm, when we don't have the Bible paradigm about who he is, we don't want to talk to him because he's scary or he's distant or he's irrelevant or he's, you know, doesn't have power. He is all powerful, wise, and good. I want to give you this dare, okay? This is John 1, 17 through 18, the words of Jesus. I think Jesus, I think this was said about him in a way to kind of provoke us, okay? I just think it's really interesting word uh, usage, word choice, okay? Here it is. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father and has made him known. Closest relationship. I just feel dared to be number two. Jesus is in closest relationship, meaning that there's like, in heaven's eyes, like a hierarchy of relational connectedness to the Father. And we're told Jesus is in closest relationship as though we needed that information because we wouldn't have already assumed it. He's in the closest relationship. What's to keep us from being second or fifth or 20th? What's to keep us from being the next closest relationship? It's an invitation into deep friendship with God. This, we can go as deep as we want. Listen, I just want to tell you something. If this is real, I mean, if this is true, that we can actually know God to this level of depth, what else matters? I mean, if this is true, if we can know God like Friends of the bridegroom, back, you know, quarters, group of guys, all friends, close, you know, popping towels, knowing Jesus' depth. If we can have this kind of relationship, then why am I so concerned about my job? I mean, if, if we can know God, okay, now I just want to give you this for just a second. The most popular man who has ever existed, who's also the wisest man, who's also the greatest leader, who has all power, and he's funny, he's inventive, creative, and he wants to be your best friend. What the heck are you doing with your life? I mean, why are we spinning our wheels on dumb stuff? I mean, when, when this man wants to be our best friend, and he's the one feeling gypped, he's like, I really, really, really made this like clear. I want deep friendship with you. I won't make you do it, but I want it. God wants something? There's something that God wants, as in doesn't have. Yeah, you and me, in the depth of the friendship that he wants. He's jealous for it. He wants to make a way for this. He wants this to be real in our lives. This is, I just, I love that this is real. Let me give you another verse out of John 17, 26. This is unbelievable. John 17, 26, Jesus talking. 
It says, I have made you, this is talking, he's talking to the Father, I have made you known to them, and I will continue to make you known in order that, this is the trippiest thing you've ever heard in your life, pay attention. In order that the love, that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. I am going to continue to tell them, Father, about you because I want them to understand that you feel about them the way you feel about me. That's crazy! God likes you like God likes Jesus? What are we doing with our lives? God likes me. God feels about me the way he feels about his son because I received his son and he sent his son to get me. He so liked people, he gave his son to get me. I'm the thing he wanted so much he gave his son to get me. God likes you and feels about you the way he feels about his son, Jesus. Yeah, but you don't know what I did. Don't really matter because that's how he feels. Well, yeah, but I'm a real mess. I promise I am too. This is how God feels. And Jesus says, I'm going to keep telling them. I'm going to keep making them know, this known to them. I'm going to have the Holy Spirit in them. I'm going to have the word of God bearing witness. I want them to know this in a deep, deep way in their soul that you feel about them. The love that you have for me is the way that you feel about them. I'm going to keep telling them to invite them into the depths of friendship. This is our deepest privilege. Our deepest privilege. I can't believe this. I mean, winning, like being in America and having all the access to all the stuff and the, the comforts and air-conditioned buildings, praise the lamb for AC. Having access to all this, it's like we've won the lottery. But it's totally B by comparison to this reality. God wants friendship. Have you ever had uh, one of those folks in your life? Now, if, you, if they're sitting next to you, don't make any noises or, or make any looks. You ever had one of those people in your life that they really, 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 really wanted to be your friend and you just totally weren't interested? <laughs> you're like, you're like, nah, it's good, bro. I, just, I, I appreciate it. It's, that's cool. I mean, I'm, I'm glad. I'll see you next week. I kind of think we're doing this to him. Because, like, we're, we're too busy. We're too preoccupied. We're too satisfied. We're too satisfied with other stuff. And so when it comes to this incredible offer with this billionaire, you know, brilliant leader, most popular person with the most Instagram followers ever in human history, we're just kind of like, you know, bro, I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm good to know you a little, <laughs> but I don't know that I want to go, go all the way. We're, we're confused. <laughs> I just think it's a perspective issue. I think... If we understood what we've been given invitation to, I think we'd all sign up. I think it's, we're just, it's, how could this be real? That's, I think, the issue is, how could this be real? It just, it's too incredible. It's too impossible. It's real. This is real. This is how he feels about us. This is what he wants. I just want to give you a few more verses, and then we'll close out today. Proverbs 8.17 Jeremiah 29, 13, James 4, 8. They all say the same thing, really. Got those three up there. Uh, go to the next one, if you would. These three verses. I just want to tell, say it this way. Relationships take work. I love my wife, but it's not enough that I do the laundry or, well, that's a bad example. I do the dishes, though. I do the dishes. <laughs> Don't tell her I even said the laundry. It'll cause problems at my home. Okay. <clears throat> But it's not enough that I do the dishes or that, you know, I, I take the kids out for ice cream or that, you know, I, I you know, get her something nice on her, on her birthday or anniversary. If I don't spend time with my wife, I don't have a relationship with my wife. It takes relationship. It takes time. The quality of all of our relationships is based on time. That's just reality. It just takes time. You, you ever have one of those friends that you know them, they know you, but, like, you don't get to spend much time with them. You get to see them once every other year or something. You spend half the time you're together small talking about, so did you move houses and, and where, okay, how many kids you got now? I mean, it's like, but it, 
you don't even get to the meat of like what's going on in their heart and soul and stuff because it takes all that catching up. That's not what our relationship with the Lord is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be depth and then more depth and more depth daily. Daily conversation, daily talking, prayer, a real prayer life. It's just talking to God daily, reaching the reach of the heart. You know, a broken and humble, contrite heart, he has yet to deny. If you reach, you'll find him. Look at these verses. Proverbs 8, 17. I love those who love me. And those who seek me, find me. You seek him, you will find him. Jeremiah 29. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I just, listen. He's the one that set the whole thing up. He's the one that wants deep friendship. He wants it more than you. He sent his son. You haven't done that yet. Okay, he, he went further for this friendship thing than you and I have, all right? He's all about it, but you don't get a cultivated garden by just letting the weather come and go. You gotta spend some time. You gotta cultivate. You gotta spend the time, but it's not labor if it's this. Prayer is not labor. Prayer is relationship. If we're getting to spend time with the one that loves us and went this far and wants to have deep friendship, oh, it's not labor. It's a joy. And I just want to tell you, I think that the reason that the Lord laid this message on my heart this morning for you is so that us together, we can reach for that which Jesus desperately wants to see formed in our lives. Not just friendship. He's totally dissatisfied with just being friends with you. He wants depth of intimate friendship, but he won't force it. We're going to have to cultivate it. We're going to have to spend that time. Listen, I I didn't have time this morning to give you all the how-tos. I mean, that would take a little bit more time. But to just give a provoking, like, stirring of our hearts to go, if that's available, I want it. I mean, does that sound right? If, if you're, your hands up, if, if you're going, I, I, I want that. I want that. Like, if that's available, I want more of that. I just want to tell you, if you seek him, if you spend that time daily with this paradigm, he's not far off, he's near, he's not dis- he's, he's in love, he's not a taskmaster, he's a friend beckoning you into deeper friendship with him. If we'll spend this time, we will grow in friendship. Amen? 